Man, so the title of this, mor- this morning's sermon is The Inequality of Sin. The Inequality of Sin. And what I'm preaching against this morning is this idea or this philosophy that's out there that all sin is equal. Now, how many people have probably heard that in their life? That, hey, you know, you know one sin is the same as another sin. We're all sinners. And, uh, you know, therefore, all sin is equal. Well, we're going to, hopefully by the end of the sermon, you'll see that that is not true. That all sin is, in fact, not equal. Right. And the source of that error, where that, that idea or that thinking comes from, is completely unknown to me. I don't understand where people get that. And, and it's so unbiblical that even most, you know, compromised, watered down, lukewarm churches, uh, even they understand this. A lot of them will even preach, hey, no, actually some sins are worse than others. That all sin is not uh, equal. So just trying right out of the gate, just trying to figure out where does this even come from? Where does this mentality come from? You know, and I can't put my finger on it where exactly, uh, uh, you know, I first heard this, but, you know, I don't recall ever having heard it preached in any church that I've ever been in. You know, and I haven't been in a lot of churches, but, you know, before I got in a King James only independent, fundamental, fire breathing, soul winning Baptist church, you know, before I got into that, I'd been in, you know, for a very short amount of time in some more liberal churches. And I don't recall ever hearing them preach this or and now I never recall them hearing them preach against it either but you know I'm, I'm trying I'm scratching my head trying to figure out where do people even come up with this idea that all sin is equal because when you really start to break that down and really start to think about what you're saying when well all sin is the same you know it, it, it's ridiculous it's it's ludicrous to sit there and think that you know stealing uh, you know some small item or something that a child might do some sin that a child might commit you know, is on par with something that a, you know, a full-grown adult is capable of. You know, some sins aren't even available to us in certain stages of our life or certain situations of, of our life. For example, you know, the Bible warns about those that will be rich. Uh, for those that will be rich have, will pierce themselves with many, through with many sorrows. And, uh, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, ri- you know, riches, you know, for a lot of people will ruin them. You know, there's a lot of sins that, we're just never going to get involved in because of the fact that we can't afford it, right? And there's a lot of other people out there that can't afford it, and they get into some pretty wicked sins. So this whole idea of all sin being equal, when you start to really think about it, doesn't make any sense, and it's hard to even understand where it comes from. Now, where I have heard it is out door knocking. You know, we go out into the community here in Tucson, and we knock on doors, and we ask people if they're saved, and if we can show them from the Bible what it takes to know to be 100% sure that they're on their way to heaven and a lot of times you know we'll start to talk to these folks and some of that's where I've heard it the most is in conversation at folks with people at their at their doors of their home they'll say well you know all sin is equal so you know maybe where it comes from is from just this carnal philosophy just this carnal way of thinking uh, where of people who just kind of want to you know excuse themselves from having to live to a higher moral standard you know, people say, well, you know, it's not important how I live because at the end of the day, all sin's equal. You know, uh, it doesn't matter if I go to church or if I, if I, you know, live by the commandments or I try to keep God's word. You know, none of that matters because at the end of the day, all sin's equal. So it doesn't really matter what I do. You know, we're all on a level playing field. Now, again, uh, they'll, they'll even cite certain examples. A lot of them will even go to the Bible. You know, they'll even, I've even heard people say, well, say, you know, uh, Jesus said that if you even look on a woman to lust after, you've committed adultery in her heart. So, you know, there you go. It's okay for me to be living in fornication, unmarried with my partner and, and having that relationship because after all, you know, everybody's looked on a woman to lust, so we're all guilty. But here's the thing. We're not all guilty of that sin. We're not all fornicators. We're not all drunkards. We're not all covetous. We're not all extortioners. And those are sins that specifically would get you kicked out of church. So to sit there and say, you know, and that's according to 1 Corinthians 5, you can read that, and it gives a list of sins that if, any, if a man that is called a brother is partaking of, we are to have no company with him until he gets it right, and then he needs to be received back. But that's another sermon. But that in and of itself goes to show you that not all sin is equal. You know, there's some sins that we could be guilty of, of in this morning in this, in this building, and I guarantee you there's not a person from the pulpit to the pew in this building that doesn't have some kind of sin in their life. You know, because we're all sinners, I get that. But there's some, you know, a lot of those sins aren't going to be sins that are going to get us kicked out of church, you know, or, or suffer some other punishment. So to sit there and say that all sin is equal, it just doesn't make any sense when you just approach it logically. But this morning, what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through some scripture in the Bible 
and just debunk this carnal philosophy of all sin being equal. Now, when you look there in James chapter 2, this probably might be one of the verses that somebody could turn to to try to make this case that, hey, all sin is equal. It says there in verse, uh, verse t cha James chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now see, see, there you go. If you just do one sin, it's like you did them all. No, that's, that's not what it says. It doesn't say if you're guilty of one, you've done them all. It says you're guilty of all, right? You might, it's as if you might as well have already done them. Because, you, you know, you, what it's showing us is that we're already condemned. You know, that we're already, it's already possible for us to commit all of these sins. You know, we could, we could, or could all, uh, uh, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? For all have sinned. We understand that. And people turn to verses like this and in Romans and they say, well, the Bible says for all have sinned. You know, therefore, you know, we're all sinners. It doesn't really matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we live our life. Because after all, all sin is equal. Now, James chapter 2, verse 10 and others, it does condemn us guilty as sinners. And that's the point. That's the point of it right there. And we've all come short of the glory of God, that we are guilty of all, right? But that doesn't make us all as sinful as one another, does it? Does that mean that everybody in this room is as equally much as a sinner as the next person? Does that mean, you know, little Corbin John up here, you know, he's my spitting image. Is he guilty of all the sins that I've committed at four years of age? No. And, pray, you know, pray the Lord that he is never guilty of, of some of the sins that, you know, his father has committed and so on and so forth. You know, and for all, all of our children, you know, we pray that. But does that mean everybody in this room is at the same level of sinfulness? Do some people in this room maybe have a little bit more sin than other people? Certainly possible. Well, one thing is for certain is that not everybody in this room is not equally sinful. And everybody in the world is not equally sinful. And I don't think that's a real far stretch. I don't know that I really have to, you know, go to great lengths to convince you of that this morning. But we are going to go to the scripture. And if you would, turn over, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to start to look at some scriptures that just, just completely demolish this false way of thinking. This carnal, vain philosophy that just wants to excuse itself from having to live a godly life, a life of righteous living, and by saying, well, all sin's equal. We're going to just smash that this morning. You know, I don't want anybody walking out of this room uh, you know, not convinced of the fact that all sin, in fact, is not equal, that there is an inequality of sin. <laughs> it says there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So Paul here is saying that he is the chiefest of sinners. And is he saying, I, you know, of whom we all are sinners? You know, that we're all, hey, we're all equal sinners. You know, we're all, all sins equal. He's saying, no, he came to save sinners and I'm the worst of them. So that statement right there shows us that Jesus, or not Jesus, but Paul understood that all sin is not equal. That some people are more sinful than others. You know, and if you know the story of Paul, before he was called Paul, he was Saul. And he was, uh, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, right? And he persecuted the church. You know, he even brought letters and, and, and hailed some of the church and, and carried them away in bonds to imprisonment and even death. That he was consenting unto the death of Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts. I mean, he, before his conversion, was a wicked man. He opposed Christ. When Jesus confronted him on, the Dam on Damascus Road, he said that he kicked against the pricks. So he was a, he was a sinful man, and he knew it. You know, he did. Now, has everybody in this room persecuted the church? Have you ever had a, a believer hauled away and thrown in prison like Paul? So to sit there and say, well, all sin's equal. You know, I'm just as sinful as Paul is inaccurate. <clears throat> Go over, uh, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. How about another example where the Bible just flat out says that some sin is worse than others? You know, one that comes to mind is Genesis chapter 13, talking about the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yep. And it says in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord, what? Exceedingly. Exceedingly sinful is what they were. They weren't just your average, run-of-the-mill sinner. They were on a whole other level. They were reprobates. They were sodomites, so on and so forth. That's another sermon. But I'm just going to that scripture to show us that some people are worse sinners than others. That not everybody has this equality of sinfulness, that there is an equality, inequality to sin. 
So some sinners are worse than others just as some sins are worse than others. It's not just that some people are worse sinners than other people, but there's actually sins that you commit that are worse than other sins. And when we're gonna, I'm going to make application here at the end, so stay with me because this can apply to even us in this room that already understand this. Because there's another danger, there's an, another pitfall that can come with this line of thinking. So just stay with me. But right now, I just want to make the point that, you know, some sins are worse than others, just as some sinners are worse than others. Look there in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, people read that and they think, well, what's this one sin unto death? No, what he's referring to is the Old Testament. You know, if you've been with us through the book of De Deuteronomy, especially these last few weeks where we've been going through a lot of the, the civil law that God laid out in the Old Testament, God puts the death penalty in a lot of things. God puts the death penalty in a lot of sins that even today people are guilty of. Right? And what he's saying here is like, look, according to the word of God, there is a sin that is unto death. And it's not just one sin. There's multiple sins. That, you know, some sins are punished in God's law by a, a financial penalty. Some sins are, are punished by an actual physical beating. Uh, you know, and we're talking, you know, within a judicial system. You know, not at, like, we're not, this isn't something we do here, okay? But, you know, and some sins are also punished by death. And that right there should show you just the most casual, just, you know, read through the Bible, through the Old Testament. It, it becomes very obvious if you're paying attention, that some sins are worse than others. That some sins have a, a sin unto death, and there's a sin that is not unto death. So, just as some sinners are worse than others, some sins that people commit are worse than others as well. <clears throat> so, again, the point at the beginning of the sermon is just to debunk this carnal philosophy that all sin is equal. This idea that this excuse that people want to have, that it's okay for them to have their sin, because, you know, their, 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 our, their sin, as bad as it might be, is just the same as everybody else's. That we're all sinners. But that is not biblical. <clears throat> you know, and I, I think we could probably just close the, the, our Bibles and go home right now. And hopefully everybody's already convinced. I mean, how many more scriptures do we have to look at for you to see the fact that some sins are worse than others? That some sinners are worse than others? Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to continue to go through a few more verses here. So some sins, as we just read in verse John chapter 5, are worthy of death. Others have other punishments that are uh, listed there uh, or, or, or can be found in Scripture. <coughs> so if you see the, that there's less extreme punishments doled out for certain sins, how can they all be equal? Some sins are, in fact, worse than others. If you would, go over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. You know, this is, this is a great passage to prove this because it's right out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. It's him saying it. And of course, this is talking about the point of the story where uh, they're bringing Jesus to Pilate to have him crucified. Pilate's kind of on the fence, not sure if he wants to carry it, go through with it. It says in John chapter 19, verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, to have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me out, uh, excuse me, delivered me unto thee, hath the greater sin. So look, was was Pilate off the hook? No, Pilate was guilty. He, you know, later in the story, he he washes his hands and said, "I am free from the blood of this innocent man." Sorry, that doesn't cut it. You know, he still delivered him to be crucified. Yeah. You know, Pilate still has his sin in this part of the in this story, right? But Jesus is saying, "Look, the people that delivered me unto you." have a greater sin than you, Pilate. And uh, so just right there showing us that even in God's eyes, in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, some people are worse sinners than others. <clears throat> you know, this can be further proven if you go over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. The fact that there are going to be varying degrees of punishment in hell. Did you know that? That when the people that go to hell are going to, not everybody's going to suffer the same degree. Now look, there isn't a nice part to hell. It's not like, well, hell won't be that bad for me. I don't want any part to do with it. I don't want a toe in hell. Yep. Okay? And praise God that salvation's free, that it's all by belief, that it's not of our works of our own righteousness, but by His grace He saved us, that nobody has to go there by just simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But the people that go there, there's going to be varying degrees of punishment. Look here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost house of the sheep of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So get the context of what's going on. Jesus is sending out his twelve disciples, and he's saying, Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. He's saying, go to the lost house of the, sh- of the sheep of Israel. Right? So he's going to the Jews first. That's who he's sending them to. Right. So jump down to verse 12. And when you come into a house, salute it. Verse 13. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not, uh, be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive, receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable in the land for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So Jesus is saying, look, if I, when I send you to the city of the lost house of the tribes of Israel, when I send you to these people, and they, if they reject you, and, and you know, let your peace come unto you and leave that city, shake off the dust of your feet. He's saying, but for those people that reject you, it's going to be more tolerable for, the lands of the, 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 for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment. You know, the day of judgments was when people are going to be, you know, the, the, the resurrection where people are, you know, brought before the great white throne. The books will be opened and they'll be judged according to their works. And people will be cast, you know, into the lake of fire. That's what the Bible teaches. And he's saying, look, at that day, it would be better to be, <laughs> be a resident of Sodom and Gomorrah. Which, if you recall what I read earlier, those people were sinners exceedingly before the Lord. And we recall the story, God rained fire and brimstone out on those cities. And God is saying, look, because they have rejected you, they've rejected me, they have rejected the gospel out of hand, you know, it's going to just be worse for them than it in the day of judgment. So there's going to be a worse punishment doled out unto these people than even for those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Folks, there are varying degrees of punishment for sin. All sin is not equal. You know, because of, because of the fact that Jesus said, you know, there are some people, he said of, to Pilate, hey, this guy has the worst sin. He has the greater sin. He's saying here, these people of these cities that reject you, it, it's going to be more tolerable for other people in the day of ju- judgment. You know, their sin is going to be worse than others. <clears throat> and what is it here, you know, this is kind of a side note, but what is it here that makes, uh, you know, the, the day of to- uh, judgment more tolerable for the others than for the Jews here? It's because of the fact that these people that Jesus is sending them to are, are being held to a greater de- degree of accountability, Right? The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Right? So he's coming unto his own. He's not sending his 12 disciples to anybody else but them exclusively. And and right out of the gate, he's been amongst them preaching, doing miracles. They know who he is. They have a greater degree of accountability given their access to the truth. Given the fact that Jesus was walking amongst them, preaching to them, sending his disciples, doing the miracles. He said to them, if you believe not for my word's sake, believe me for the, for the, for the works that I do. You know, they had a greater de- degree of accountability, folks. So when you have a, 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 uh, a greater degree of accountability before God, you know, you're, uh, you know how am I trying to put this? When, you, when you're given more responsibility or more knowledge, the more you know about God, the more you know about the Bible, the more you're in church and learning the things of God, the more accountable you become to God. Even as his child, you're born again, you know, even the more so. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. If you're born again, you've been saved, you know, and he's leading you and guiding you into knowledge and all truth. You have the word of God. You have someone preaching you to the word of God. You know, you're held to a higher degree of accountability than just the guy who's never heard about Jesus, the guy who's never been in church, who doesn't know those things that you know. <clears throat> and that was what's going on here in the story. He's sending him unto a people that were held to a higher degree of accountability. And why was that? Because of what it says in Romans 3, I'll read to you. It says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Paul's saying, look, what, what, what profit is it to the Jew? What advantage do they have? It, or what profit is there of circumcision? You know, that's referring to the Jews again. What profit do they have? What advantage do they have? And he said this, much every way. He's saying, look, they have a great deal of advantage. They have a great deal of, they, they profit a great deal being a Jew, be chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the scriptures, they had the prophets, they had Jesus come to them. They were held to a higher degree 
of accountability. If you would, turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. This is a concept that Jesus taught throughout Scripture. Luke chapter 12, verse 47, we'll see again that some people are held to a higher degree of accountability and therefore will suffer a greater degree of punishment for their disobedience. It says in verse 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit such uh, things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. <clears throat> to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Look, the more you know, the more you understand of the things of God, the more accountable you are. And that's what Jesus is teaching. Look, the guy that, you know, they did the same thing. He's worthy of stripes, but he didn't know his Lord's will. You know what? He's going to get a lesser punishment. So all sins are not equal. Okay? And all sinners are not equal. Now, we're all sinners. We all deserve, you know, our, the wages of sin is death. We all deserve, you know, the death of this body, the, you know, the, the second death being cast into hell. We all deserve that because we've all committed sin. Okay? But not every, that doesn't make everybody uh, as sinful as, as, as one another. <clears throat> because of the fact also we could even talk about that some sins are considered an abomination to God. You know, if you've read through the scripture, if you listen to much preaching about it, you know, does God call every sin in the Bible an abomination? You know, God, but God does call some sins an abomination. He even calls some people who commit some sins. He says they are an abomination. So if you would turn to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> in fact, God's got a list of things that, he, that, he, uh, that are an abomination unto him in Proverbs chapter 6. If you're going to Revelation 2, I'll read to you from Proverbs 6. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate. God hates, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, our, that's the Lord. That's the Bible, that God hates some things, okay? You know, that's, that's not a very popular uh, idea out there, even amongst Christians today, that, you know, that God is love. We understand that. But God is multifaceted. God is not just a, a you know, a, you know, a uh, one-dimensional personality. You know, God is a person who has, you know, all the a range of feelings and emotions just like anybody else. It says, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, unto him. I mean, abomination, that's another level of hatred. That's to abhor something. I mean, it's to be disgusted by it. I mean, if, you know, if, if you were, I'm trying to think of an example of where, an instance where you might abhor something. And you go to a restaurant and they serve you up and you're expecting this dish and they just bring you the, 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 the one dish you despise the most. You know, and it's, it's cold and slimy and you just, ugh, you know, it's, it's, it's an abomination. I hate it. I, can't, I don't even want to smell it. I don't want to see it. I don't even want to know it's there. You know, there's other dishes you might not be your favorite, but you could put up with them, right? I, I'm, we're Baptists, so food is the greatest analogy we always use, right? But, you know, you get the idea here that abomination is, it's not just hating something. It's to be abhorred by it, to hate it uh, to a severe degree. And those things that he calls an abomination, a proud look, a lying tongue, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Those are things that God says he hates and he calls an abomination. God, now, that's a very specific list. And that should show us that some sins are worse than others. And if you're guilty of some sins, you are a worse sinner than others. Look there in Revelation chapter 2, we'll see more of the same. Look at verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast first left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he's rebuking this church here, and he's saying, Look, I have someone against thee. You know, you've left your first love. You know, your, your, your love for me is waxing cold. You're not doing the works. You need to repent. You need to get right and fix that. Otherwise, I'm going to remove your candlestick. You know, and that's basically when God just is done with the church. You know, and he takes, takes away the leadership and the church just dies, right? So <clears throat> that's what he's threatening them there with. But what I want you to notice here is the contrast between what they're guilty of and what they hate. He says there, he says, I have somewhat against thee. Does that a scathing rebuke? 
hey, I've got somewhat against you. If I were to come to you and say, hey, I've got a little bit of a problem, is that like me just coming down? You know, if a brother comes to you and says, hey, man, you know, I, I've got a bone to pick with you. I mean, we can have disagreements or we can be a, people can offend us to a certain degree to where, you know, it's not this big deal, but we, hey, we still got to work this out. Right. You see what I'm saying? And that's what he's kind of, that's what reminds me there. I have somewhat against thee. This isn't like, you know, you better get this right. I can't believe, you know, there, this is not a, a, a scathing, you know, rebuke of these people. He's just saying, look, I do have somewhat against you. But notice that with the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I do hate, which I also hate. So there's right there in that, those verses, you're seeing there's some people that, you know, these sinners, he has somewhat against them. But these Nicolaitans over here, man, he hates them. Right? Do you see the contrast there? An, again, another great verse that's showing us that not all sins are equal. That not all sinners are equal. That God hates some things, and some things, you know, he just has a bone to pick with you over. <clears throat> so, you know, another fact, that, or another thing, a way we could approach this or look at debunk this, this carnal philosophy of all sin being equal is we could talk about the fact that God, even in, his, in the Bible, prescribes a code of conduct for people who are guilty of certain sins. God, you know, he, God says, look, don't do this, but if you're going to do it, do this. If you go ahead and do it, this happens, this is how I want it handled. That's not God putting a stamp of approval on it. And we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, if you go over there. <coughs> you, you know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in tonight's sermon, but there's several examples in the Old Testament of this. And if you've been with us on Thursday nights, these will sound familiar. But what about the fact, and we can... We can no one understand <clears throat> that not all sin is equal because of the fact that God prescribes a code of conduct for some sins that people are guilty of. Okay, one sin in particular is those that are guilty of divorce. Now, divorce is a sin. Okay, the Bible is very clear about that. But look what he says here in De Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes <clears throat> because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is debarred out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So he's saying, look, divorce is a sin, but here's an exception. And if you're going to do it, you know, you're going to write a bill of divorcement. And I'm going to talk about this more specifically tonight. You know, th this one exception that God has for divorce. Right? But again, we're seeing that God is prescribing a code of conduct. And, and, he's, and, and he, his will is not for people, you know... You know, I really don't want to get into myself tonight's sermon, but in Deuteronomy 24, Jesus even rebukes that and says, you know, Moses gave you, <coughs> allowed you to write a bill of divorcement for the hardness of your hearts. Ideally, what would happen in this situation is he would just forgive her and they would move on with their lives. But God understands man. He knows that, you know, some men, they just, they can't do that. That, that they, they have the right to go ahead and expect one thing and if they get another, then in this instance, you know, they're allowed to, to divorce. And again, I'm going to go over that tonight, so if you're curious about that, come on back. What about the sin of polygamy, right? <clears throat> God can, does not condone a polygamy. Multiplying wives. And if you would turn over to keep something in Deuteronomy, go over to Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Now, did people in the Old Testament, did they have multiple wives? Oh, yeah. I mean, Solomon had a lot, right? Uh, David multiplied wives. A lot of kings had multiply, uh, multiple wives. You know, it was something that happened a lot in the Old Testament. Now, here's a, again, this is something that cannot be reiterated enough when it comes to your Bible reading. Just because you read about something happening in the Bible does not mean God is condoning of it. God gives us stories in the Bible, and all he's doing is telling us what happened. A lot of times people open up their Bible and they read something that just happened, a narrative in the Bible, and they go, oh, God must approve of that. You know, that must be what I should do. Okay, well, what about when Judas went and hung himself? Right. <laughs> you know, should you go do that? No, it's just telling you that's what happened. Yeah. Right? It's not God approving of it. It's just saying, look, this is what happened. And people multiplied wives. They had multiple wives in the Bible, but that does not mean God approved of it. God, in, in fact, specifically said of the kings that they were not to multiply to themselves wives. He said that. And he said, it was, you know, one man and one woman. You know, and they twain shall be one flesh, is what he said. Right? <clears throat> Thank you, brother. <clears throat> so, again, God, <clears throat> he disapproves of multiplying wives, but he understands, look, it's going to happen. That some people are going to be worse sinners than others. Some of them are going to disregard God's rules, God's word, and they're going to go ahead and they're going to, you know, um, commit that sin of polygamy. 
And he says here in Deuteronomy 21, verse 7, If a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, <coughs> she shall not go out as the men servants <coughs> do. Excuse me. If she please not her master who hath betrothed them to herself, then, she, uh, then shall he let her be redeemed. To, uh, to sell her into a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he hath betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall not be diminished. Right? So he's saying, look, if this, this girl that is working off, you know, is working off this debt for her family is, ends up being betrothed either to her master or her master's son, you know, she has certain rights as the wife. And if that master or the master's son who takes her as her wife then decides to go get another wife, which God does not condone of, because it's multiplying wives, he says, look, but if that happens, this is what you're going to do. You know, you're going to make sure that her raiment, her food does not diminish. You're going to still take care of her as, 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 her, as your wife. You know, you're not going to treat her as second class. So again, this is a great example of, you know, there are things that, that sins that take place in the Bible that God does not approve of, but it's not like, but God at the same time is prescribing a code of conduct. And the whole point I'm trying to make here is that showing us that, look, some sins are worse than others. Some sins are not as bad as others. Does that mean we should go commit these sins? No. But, it doesn't, but what I'm trying to get us across is we should not have this mentality of thinking all sins equal. That it doesn't matter what we do. And we're going to get into it more, to a, uh, a more of an application to us to this morning here in a minute. <laughs> so, there's, we can look at another Deuteronomy 22. We're just going to move on for the sake of time. I feel like everybody's kind of got this concept. Okay? So, <clears throat> if people, what they do is they, they, they say, no, you know, the Bible is clear that Hey, you know, some sins are not as bad as others. You know, we're all sinners. It doesn't matter what we do. And their misunderstanding, you know, their, their, their shallow understanding of Scripture and their carnal motivations to justify whatever they're involved in and in, in their, in their sin, they start to misapply Scripture to suit their needs. They start to go to passages and say, well, this is what, you know, the Bible says this here, and they start to twist and rest the Scripture. If you would, go over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, this is one. Uh, look at verse 14. <clears throat> this is one that you might hear in a more liberal church. You know, this, this, this grace only thing that, you know, somehow we're not accountable because we're saved. The Bible says in verse 14 in Romans 6, for sin shall not have the dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, who's ever heard of this philosophy? Hey, man, we're under grace. It doesn't matter what we do. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, we're saved. We can do whatever we want. You know, we're saved. God, it's like we can do whatever we want because, you know, God, we're saved. God doesn't even see what we do. And they, they excuse themselves from a, a life of holy living that God has called us unto. They excuse themselves from, from adhering to, to just the, the, the commands of Scripture because they're under grace. Now, are we under grace? Yeah. But we are not without the law. That doesn't, that doesn't make the law void in our lives. These are still, there are still standards and, and commandments that we have to live up to, not to go to heaven, but to be pleasing to God. God doesn't just save us and then just go, do whatever you want. Because doing whatever us, what we wanted is what got us into trouble in the first place. So that doesn't make any sense. But they'll say, hey, look, you know, we're, we're under grace. We're not under the law. So it doesn't matter what we do. We can get away with it. That philosophy is out there. And they love verse 14. But the irony is it's just sandwiched between these verses that compl completely just demolishes that line of thinking. Back up to verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He's saying, look, you need to fight against sin. Don't let it have the dominion over you, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. So here he is admonishing them to not let sin reign in their body. Paul said, you know, I die daily. I, I keep my body under it and bring it into subjection. You know, he goes on and says, neither yield yourselves, as uh, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and as your members as instruments of righteousness of God. 
Then he gets to verse 14. So they, they ignore those verses where he's saying, don't sin, yield yourself to God, you know, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies, you know, mortify the, 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 the flesh and the deeds thereof. Right? And then they get to verse 14. Hey, we're under grace. You know, we're not under the law. So we can do whatever we want. No, you still have you know, to get sin out of your life. Look at verse 15, right on the other side. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. I mean, the next verse just demolishes this line of thinking. We're under grace, bro. Doesn't matter what we do. You know, God's not gonna be mad at you. Do whatever you want. Feels good. You're saved, right? God doesn't care. The next verse. Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? God forbid. He's saying, no way. No way we should have that attitude. No way we should have that mentality that we can just do whatever we want because we're saved. <laughs> he goes on and says in verse 16, Knowing not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to, to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. What about Romans chapter 8? Turn over there. Romans chapter 8. This is one I've heard out of a liberal church. They'll say, you know, there's no condemnation. Verse 1, look at verse 1. They, want, they love the first two verses here in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, when the first time I confronted a guy who was, you know, you know when I first time I first got saved, and first, you know, before I really got in church, I started going to the, like this, you know, this youth Bible study, and it was like this real ecumenical. They had people from all kinds of denominations getting together in these people's house, and it was just a bunch of, you know, kids, you know, waving their arms and playing, you know, as the deer pant, you know, <laughs> these touchy-feely songs, and, and uh, you know, then we, we have a quick prayer, and everybody just basically sat around and ate junk food and played Uno, right? You know, it was this, this Christian prayer group or whatever. But there was this guy who I knew from high school. He showed up, and there was this other girl. She was going there, you know, and, and she's showing up in the, the tank tops and the short shorts, and eventually they're, they're getting together, and it comes pretty obvious what's going on there. And I finally confronted him and said, you can't, you're a Christian. I mean, I didn't know much at that point, but I knew, look, man, the Bible condemns fornication. He said, well, I talked to my pastor about it. He talked to his pastor. Okay, and then he said, my pastor said, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. And that's where he ended. Fools should have kept reading the rest of the verse. Let alone the rest of Romans 8 or Romans 6 or any other passage in the Bible practically. Well, there's no condemnation then which are in Christ Jesus. It's okay for me to just be sleeping around out of, out of marriage with this girl and committing fornication and doing whatever else that we're into. Because we're not condemned. We're in Christ. It says, there's no condemnation which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. Meaning this, that if you're in Christ Jesus and you're saved and, you're wa and you are in the flesh, you're condemned. Not to hell, but to punishment. God will, you know, God, bro, go read Hebrews 12. Yeah. He chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. He scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There's not a son whom he chasteneth not. And if you be without chastisement, then you are bastards and not sons. That's what the scripture says. That if you can say, you could say you're saved, that I believe on Christ, and then you can go out and live a wicked life and have no consequences, I question your salvation. Right. Whether you really believe. If you can just go live a wicked life and God doesn't come down. I mean, I look back on my life. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I got saved in my early 20s. I learned things the hard way. And I can look back at my life and go, oh yeah, I, when I was you know, backslidden and into this and that, and I can just see God just whipping me just for years, just like try to get me right. Just fix yourself, son. I look back now and I say, praise God that I have a loving Heavenly Father that doesn't just let me walk in the flesh. But this is a contrary to this mentality that's out there that we can just do whatever we want as God's children and there's no consequences. That's wrong. That's not Bible. He says right there, if you walk after the flesh, that there is condemnation. Right? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin of death. Keep reading the passage. Look at verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Yes, he made us free from sin, but he also condemned sin in the flesh in the process. He's saying, look, I'm saving you 
because you're sinful and wicked. And he's condemning us in the process. He's condemning sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit mind the things of the, the, things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. It's punishment. It's condemnation. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. <clears throat> because the carnal mind is enmity with God, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, if you're living in the flesh, if you've got sin in your life that you're not taking care of, you cannot please God. And you are going to be chastened by God. That's why this, this, this philosophy that all sin is equal is so dangerous. You know, not only to the unsaved, but to the saved, to the child of God. They can let this philosophy creep in. <coughs> You know, and they, they have other passages. I remember talking to a guy once. He said, you know, well, I don't go door to door like you guys and preach the gospel. I just go down to the bar. And, you know, I don't drink. You know, I just go to the bar and I order, you know, water and I just shoot some pool and I get to know these guys, you know. I meet the sinners where they're at. And, you know, on the surface, that sounds great, doesn't it? You know, but they'll quote, they'll, they'll quote 1 Corinthians chapter 9. They'll say, you'll say, you know, I, I made all things to all men that I by all means might save some. We've probably all heard that. You know, so I make myself like a, like a wine, you know, like a drunkard to the drunk. I'm not a drunkard, but, you know, I'm going down to the bar and I'm hanging out with them. You know, just trying to establish a rapport. Do you think people in the bar are there to hear about Jesus? No. They don't want to hear about Jesus down there. It's a waste of time, Right? And here's the thing, the Bible says avoid the mere appearance of evil. Yep. You know, you might be down there with good intentions, but, you know, if the wrong person sees you there and recognizes you, and they just, assume, they're just going to, if I saw you coming out of a bar, what do you think my first uh, assumption is going to be? Oh, you must be down there witnessing for the Lord. <laughs> do you think that's what I'm going to think if I see you walking out of a casino? Oh, he's just in there trying to, you know, you know get with the common man and just, you know. Which Jesus, you know, I don't want to go into that. But look, no, I'm going to think, oh, he's down there getting drunk. Oh, he's down there gambling away his money. You know, that, that's what I'm going to think. <clears throat> and rightly so, because that's likely what's going on. But did, did people have this idea that, well, we're just going to go down there and, and, you know, we're just going to be made all things to all men. You know, but we, they forget verse 21. To them with our, that are without the law as without the law. Right? Being not without the law to God. Saying, look, I'm, I'm as unto them, uh, the, those the, uh, I'm unto them without the law, as unto without the law. Let me just read it. I'm, I'm butchering it. He's saying here, to them that are without the law, as without the law. Look, I'm going to be like they are. Being not without the law of God. He's saying, look, I'm like that, but I still have the law of God. Right. You, know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to just go become sinful just so I can win a sinner. You know, I'm not going to go just, you know, live a life of sin. You know, I'm not going to become this undercover agent for Christ. You know, I'm not going to go into like, you know, deep, uh, what do they call it? You know, deep cover, you know, for Jesus. Go get involved in the gangs and the, and the drugs and everything else. And just say, well, I'm just there for Jesus, you know. I'm just trying to work up a rapport and bring these guys around to the Lord and show them a better way by, by living like they are. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so... You know, it's just, just another stupid arguments out there. And where does it all stem from? From this idea that God does not hold people accountable for their sins, that all sin is equal, that some, you know, no one's worse than another person. But the Bible we've seen thus far shows us very clearly that some sins are worse than others, that some sinners are worse than others, that not everybody is as sinful as another person. Now, a very sinful person can become an unsinful person. People can clean up their lives and they can start walking in the light. They can start living for the Lord and get on the straight and narrow and they can become less sinful. You know, and if we're in here this morning and we've got sin in our life and you're saying, man, I, I, you know, I don't like the idea that I'm more sinful than somebody else. Well, then get the sin out of your life. You know, but don't expect others to come down. Well, let me get some sin in my life so, you know, you can feel better about yourself. That's not, that, that's foolish thinking. But to make all sin equal, you know, this philosophy is foolish, it's dangerous, 
And what it does is it downplays the negative impact of sin. You know, sin has serious consequences in our life. I mean, there's sins from my past that I'm dealing with every day. You know, there's going to be that probably we'll have to deal with for the rest of my life. Consequences from sin that we'll have to deal with for the rest of our lives. And, so, and that's the way it is. So we don't want to get caught up or tolerate these philosophies that downplay the impacts of sin in our lives. The Bible says in Proverbs uh, 14, go over to Psalms chapter 19. Psalms 19, we're almost done. But Proverbs 14 says, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. It says, fools make a mock at sin. Oh, sin's no big deal. All sin's equal. God doesn't mind. It's not that big a deal. You're a fool. You're making a mock at sin. And sin has, you know, when sin hath, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished, the Bible says, bringeth forth death. You know, nothing good comes from sin. So, we all understand that, hopefully, by now. We probably understood this before we even walked through the doors this morning, that not all sins are equal. But if you didn't, hopefully I've made the case this morning. You know, we saw, we looked at a lot of different scriptures that show us that not all sin is equal, that there is an equality in sin. And we get that, but here's the, other, here's the danger, here's how I want to apply this tonight, or this morning, is don't let your understanding of this become an excuse for your sin. I mean, some of us could be sitting in here and thinking, yeah, I understand not all sin is equal, and, but the sin that I have is, isn't that bad of one. You know, if God called me out for my sin, he would just say, I have someone against thee. He wouldn't say, I hate that. You know, we understand that some sinners are worse than others, and we go, well, you know, and my sin's not that bad. And maybe your sin and the scale of sin is not that bad. But should you hang on to that? Because remember, again, what we talked about, the more you know, the more accountable you are. Unto whom much is given shall much also be required. You know, your sin might be a little sin, but you know you shouldn't be doing it. And you're doing it anyway. So God's going to hold you more accountable even for that little sin. So don't let this philosophy, this understanding of this philosophy, rather, don't let your understanding that all sin is not equal excuse you from your little sin because your little sin is magnified by the fact that you understand this. Does that make sense? <coughs> don't let this understanding become an excuse for sin. We should not harbor pet sins because they aren't as bad as other sins. Well, my little sin over here isn't that bad. Therefore, I'm going to keep it. That's wrong. That is a bad attitude. That's, gonna, that's dangerous, friend. The Bible says, you're in Psalm 19. It says in Psalm 66, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I would have to assume if you're in church this morning that you're a person who's concerned about being heard by God. A person that wants to pray and know that God is hearing you. I'd assume that about everybody. But my question is, are you regarding iniquity in your heart? Well, I'm not regarding, you know, it's not like I'm out on the town, you know, last night just living it up and running around. Wasn't doing that. You know, so this little bit of iniquity that I'm regarding in my heart isn't that bad. No, he says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, if you know what you're doing is wrong, if you know what sin it is, and I'm not here to, you know, call out people's sins. You know what it is. Right? If that, if that, whatever it is, your people, if, you know, I'm not saying everybody has this, but if, if you do, if you're sitting there thinking, hey, I've got, I know exactly what he's talking about. Boy, you know, that sin right there. That's the one I'm talking about. That's the one that's going to keep your prayer from being heard. Is that what you want? It's not what I want. You know, and this is something we all have to be on guard for. Look at Psalm 19. Who can understand, verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins. Sins that I know this is wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. And a lot of times we go ahead and we do it anyway. Why? Because we say, it's not as bad as this sin. You know, it's not, you know, I'm going to go ahead and look at this, you know, porno because after all, it's not me committing adultery. You know, I'm just going to stay here at home and drink a six pack because obviously it's not me down at the bar drinking hard whiskey and getting into fist fights. And we justify our sins in our life. <coughs> but that's, that's, presumptuous, that's sinning presumptuously. Okay? That's you regarding iniquity in your heart because, oh, I have an understanding 
that my sin isn't as bad as somebody else's. But your understanding makes that sin even worse because you know better. And by the way, this preaching right now is making you even more accountable. So if you don't like the way it's going, you better get out. <laughs> no, stay. We're almost done. There's still a few more donuts. Now look, we understand. I'm not, I'm not preaching that you, know, you need to reach the sinless state of perfection. It's never going to happen. That's not going to happen. You know, we're going to sin every day. We're probably going to do things that we don't even realize are sin every day. You know, we're flesh. You know, we still have this body of, of the flesh. We still fight the flesh. But we're not to let it have a dominion over us. You know, 1 John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And there are people out there that say, oh, I've reached sinlessness in this life. No, you haven't. Yeah, right. And that right there is a sin in and of itself because that's one of the proudest, arrogant statements I've ever heard. And pride is a sin. But we should strive to be so. Just because, you know, say, well, I'm never going to reach sinlessness, so why bother? <laughs> that, should that be our attitude? Should that be our philosophy? I'm just going to go on ahead and just keep my little pet sin because I, I'm going to do something today. It might as well be something I enjoy. Just something I'm used to doing. And should that be our attitude? No. We should strive for sinlessness in our life. We should fight against the flesh. We should mortify our members and, and want to do better. And when God sees you doing that, and when you mess up and you commit a sin and you backslide, you have your weak moment or whatever, and those should become fewer and fewer and farther and farther between as you grow in your Christian life. But nobody's without sin. <clears throat> but when God sees you down and, and, you're, and looks down and he sees one of his children striving against sin, resisting sin, resisting the devil, praying, God, please help me to not do this. Coming to him in, an, in a moment of weakness rather than just giving in. That person's going to get more grace from God. That person's going to get more help. That person's going to be heard rather than the person just says, well, you know, my sin isn't that bad. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway. <clears throat> that person's going to get punished. We should strive to reach that perfection. Galatians 5 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Did you know it's possible to not fulfill the lust of the flesh? That it's possible if you walk in the Spirit. That's the key, and that's, that's not always easy, is it, to walk in the Spirit? To, because one, to get, walk with the Spirit, you've got to get in the Spirit, right? You've got you to get in it, to walk in it. You've got to get up and pray. You've got to get up and read your Bible. You've got to get to church. You've got to get the sin out. You've got to memorize the Scripture. You've got to you know, do the work. That takes effort on your part. You're not just going to wake up one morning and be in the Spirit. You can be saved. You can be sealed by the Holy Spirit. But there's a far, it's a far cry from being sealed by the Spirit and being, fill, and being filled with the Spirit. It's two different things. Having the God's stamp of this is mine, the seal of the Spirit, this is my child, is not the same as being filled with the Spirit. And that's what it's going to take to walk in the Spirit, is you have to be filled with Him. <clears throat> so we should strive to do that, you know, to not commit those sins that we're given to. What about, you know, we're, and that's just talking about the, sin, the, the sins that we commit, the bad things that we do, right? The sins of commission is what that's called. The sins we commit. And we haven't even, that's just one, you know, that's just one side of the spectrum of sin. Then there's also the, the, the sin of not doing the right thing. We don't often think about that one. When we talk about sin, we often think about the sins of commission, the th bad things that we do. But we don't always think about the good things that we don't do. That sin as well. The Bible says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> you say, well, you know, why, you know, is it, it is a sin not to read my Bible? Well should, well, should you read your Bible? Yeah. You know that. Should you go to church? Yeah. You know that. Are those good things to do? Yeah. Should you tell others about the Lord and, and try to preach them the gospel? Yeah. Do you always do that? Nope. And to him it is sin. So, you know, sin has got, you know, it's got us pegged on either side, folks. It's the, 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 the bad things that we do, the good things that we don't do. It's a, it's a fight, and it's on. And, and we don't want to be guilty of people that are just getting steamrolled by sin and just letting it have its way in our lives. Um, that's no way to live. God's going to not be pleased with that. So, understanding that sin's inequality 
you know, it makes you more accountable, not less. Even for smaller sins that are in your life. So don't forget the, the saying. There's a saying. You ever heard that saying? The devil is in the details. Right? The little things. That's where the devil often is. He's in the details. He's in those little things. You know, he, he, you know, and don't forget this. Little sins lead to bigger ones. People just don't run out. You know, they don't go from living a godly Christian life to just committing adultery the next day. Or, you know, whatever, you know, we could sit here and think about the most horrible things that people do. The perfect example of that is King David in the Old Testament. I mean, King David, you know, committed the, the sin of adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed. A man of God. The Bible said that the sweet psalmist of Israel, the man after God's own heart, the Bible says, committed those sins. Now, is adultery and murder bad sin? That's wicked. And God actually puts the death penalty on it. And when, when, when the prophet Nathan came to, to him and said, Thou art the man, he said, I have sinned. And God said, Never let, you know, thou shalt not die. You know, he gave him a pass because God will be merciful and to whom he will be merciful. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, David just didn't wake up one day and do that. What did it start with? It said he went out on his roof in the evening. He was idle. At a time when kings went to war, he was at home, bored. And he just went out for a walk and he saw Bathsheba bathing. And he looked where he shouldn't look and then one thing led to another. He, should, he wasn't leaving up to his responsibilities. He was idle. He saw something he shouldn't. Then he goes and commits adultery. Now there's a baby on the way. Now i got to have her husband killed. That's how sin goes. The devil is in the details. It's in the little things. Those little sins that we hang on to because they're not as bad as others. They're just as dangerous, though, because of where they lead, where they'll take us. The Bible says in Galatians 5, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. So we understand this morning, in all likelihood, I'm sure everybody gets it, that it's foolish to think that all sin is equal. It's a foolish thing to think that. It's just not biblical. You can think that if you want, but don't tell me that's what the Bible teaches. And we need to be careful of, of not forgetting the dangers of entertaining the little sins in our life because those are the ones that are going to lead to bigger sins and they're you're just as dangerous. And we're held accountable for our understanding that all sin is not equal. Let's go ahead and pray.